Once you have maps showing how you and your industry create value for users, you can share these with others so they can challenge them. This will allow you to start tapping into the collective intelligence of your organization and wider networks more effectively. And the more eyeballs you have on the situation, the more awareness you're going to develop about what's really happening and why. To demonstrate the importance of challenging assumptions, let's return to the coffee shop example we looked at earlier. Our users, if you remember, are members of the public who are looking for a great cup of coffee. But a great cup of coffee doesn't appear by magic. It needs lots of other components to make it happen, such as coffee beans and cups. And those coffee beans need water and a coffee machine to turn them into coffee fit for drinking. And the coffee machine needs a power source to run it. This is a very simplified value chain for a coffee shop making great cups of coffee. But it serves our purpose for demonstrating the power of challenging assumptions. First, let's apply the evolution axis to show how evolved each component is in our market. We can see that coffee beans are a mature product, meaning we'll probably have lots of suppliers we can source them from. Cups themselves are a commodity, meaning they're pretty hard to differentiate on except for price and availability. While the water and the power we need to run our coffee machine are utility services, highly reliable components where we just pay for what we use. Now this isn't a perfect map. No map is, as that would require a map that is one-to-one -one scale, which would render it useless. Therefore, we're interested in having a map that's useful. And this one is because we can show it to others who can point out what we've missed, like staff to serve customers or some kind of payment terminal. And they may even start to challenge the assumptions underlying our business or the industry itself, such as, do we even need staff? Couldn't we invest in robot service instead? It's exactly these type of conversations we're looking to stimulate because it's from discussions such as these that new innovative ideas emerge, and all ways of doing things are identified and challenged. We call this looking for fifth men. It's based on a story from the Second World War. One day, Winston Churchill, the British Prime Minister, was inspecting an artillery unit performing a firing drill. He was impressed by the speed with which a four-man team loaded, aimed and fired a large gun hitched to the back of a truck but he noticed another member of the team standing off to the side, doing nothing. What's his role? Churchill asked the officer of the artillery unit. That's the fifth man, sir, the officer replied. Fifth man has always been there, sir, he said, but could not explain more. That evening, the insatiably curious Churchill took a book from his library about this artillery regiment, which had first been deployed in the Crimean War, 90 years earlier. Flipping through the pages, Churchill came across a sketch of the artillery team, and there he saw the same four-man team in slightly different uniforms, loading a slightly different gun, but performing the same tasks he had seen earlier in the day. And there, standing off to the side, was the fifth man, holding the horses they used to move the gun from one place to another. Now this story may not be true, but it doesn't stop it from being a useful description of what happens in many organizations. Things are usually done for a reason, but everything evolves, and what was once necessary, for example holding the horses so they didn't run off, becomes unnecessary, as guns in World War II were transported on motorized vehicles. But practices change more slowly, as people rarely challenge why things are done. They're just told, that's the way it has always been done, and they rarely question it. Out of habit, we keep doing things long after they've stopped adding any value. And if you're in an organization of any longevity, you'll have fifth men all over the place, continuing to do what they've always done, but add little to no value today. This waste is no one's fault. It emerges quite naturally over time. But to remove it requires challenge, and that requires maps so people can see the entire system and question the assumptions underlying why things are done the way they are. Then, once you've found your fifth men, you can redeploy them to more productive areas, reducing waste and putting people into roles that add value and motivate them. Going back to the value chain of our coffee shop, can you see any fifth men here? Is there anything that is adding less value than it should? Normally, it's the job of the chief finance person to call out wasted investments. So let's put up one of those tools, a simplified profit and loss statement for our coffee shop and see if you can spot where the waste is now. It's not easy, is it? 
but if you look at this information on our map, it should be easier to see the anomaly. Why are we custom building our coffee machine? We can see clearly that the cost of maintaining this coffee machine is nearly twice the amount of profit we're making from each cup of coffee sold. We could save a huge amount of money if we bought a standard coffee machine instead. So why are we doing this? Well, the answer may be that our coffee machine used to be considered special. Maybe it was unique ones and was the reason customers came to our coffee shop. But when we focus on user needs, which was the second principle we looked at in this series, we can see that while users want high-quality coffee, it doesn't mean it has to be made on an expensive, custom-built coffee machine. In fact, the coffee machine is low down on the value chain, meaning it probably isn't something that is very visible to customers, so they're unlikely to care about it much. As long as the coffee tastes great, users will be happy. So the question is, can we make great coffee on a machine that we can buy commercially? Of course we can. And this is the purpose of a map. You challenge to create a better map and a better understanding of your situation. Then you identify moves you can make that create more value for your users and for you. Now, challenging assumptions might sound uncomfortable, especially to senior management who aren't used to having their ideas criticized. But remember, people are challenging their maps. They're not challenging each other. Maps help depersonalize challenge by getting everyone on the same page and combining their collective intelligence to improve the effectiveness of the organization. This is why challenge is the duty of everyone in an organization. It's how we stop wasting resources on fifth men and start improving and innovating instead. But to do this, you're going to need to start mapping.